I forgot to start the recording, so now I'm doing it. Um, so she just started in that position not too long ago. Um, she also is really into fiber arts. And so that is kind of one of my jams. So I was excited about that. And from anything, she said fiber arts to electronics. So there's a lot of wiggle room in there. So uh, <laughs> as you could tell just from that slight description alone, she's obviously a public librarian. <laughs> she has such a wide range of interests. So Shannon, thank you for being here to teach us and to share your brain with us for this hour. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you so you can just start in right away. And um, thank you again for being here. Thank you so much for having me. It's delightful. Um, yes, I'm a total dilettante. Uh, I dabble in about a thousand things. And yes, that's totally a public librarian thing to do. So hi, I'm Shannon. I'm, I'm just going to talk for a second before we move forward about how we're going to structure this webinar and how it, it's going to act as a conversation. So what I would like to do is encourage all of you to chime in with a story or a question or an idea. And crazy ideas are great. We want those, even if you haven't really thought them through. You can argue with me. Feel free. I'm going to have some strong opinions here. Push back. I like that. Um, we'll learn more through that. Um, but I would like to try to keep each slide to maybe one or two of your stories or questions. So if, if it's going a little long, we're going to try and uh, ask you to delay or ask that later. Um, but I recognize that this kind of conversational style really privileges those who are quick on the draw with questions and ideas. So I want to make space for people who are a little more methodical and deliberative and thoughtful, or if you just reflected on something and come up with an idea what seems like you know several slides later it's totally okay bring those things in we'll weave these all together into this conversation we're going to have and in fact if we don't get through 100 percent of this presentation it's okay we can either do it again some other time or you can you can start from where uh where we leave off and and think about the things on your own so Reminder, just go ahead and chime in, speak up, whatever, interrupt me. It's totally fine. I can work with you however you want to do this. Um, and, and to all of this end, I would really love to know the way that everybody is currently engaging with maker spaces. If you have a maker space, if you're thinking about adding one, if you're just maker space curious, Throw that in the um, chat so Amy can kind of get a sense of where we are and I can appropriately move this conversation to meet you where you are. And then the final thing is I'm going to do a little disclaimer here because I am going to sound incredibly cranky. And I don't want you all leaving thinking, wow, she's just mad. Um, in fact, I'm coming at these maker spaces and the research I've done very critically, but every single person who participated in this um, studies that I'm talking about, they're wonderful librarians and human beings. I consider many of them, most of them, uh, personal friends. So I'm gonna sound pushy because my method is to like poke at things with sticks until they break and see what how we can make them better. In fact, um, I really like the phrase or the saying of if, if it ain't broke, let's make it better anyway. So that's where I'm coming from. So if you sound, if you hear me sound cranky, that's why. And then finally, I want to give you guys a link. Hold on, let me pull up this link for you uh, to something we're going to be using in a moment. Um, a checklist. Let's see if I can get this to work on my brand new Mac that I really don't know how to use. Nope, not working. All right, let me try a different way. Um, actually, that's okay because I uploaded it. So oh, you did. I did! Awesome! So if you, if everyone listening goes back one screen to your PDF and slides, you'll be able to see it. It's okay. Good to you there. I did just link it here too. Oh, there you go. Slide. Perfect. All right. Can we move forward a slide? Absolutely. Great. So yeah, as we mentioned, I was 19 years in public libraries doing pretty much everything you can do in public libraries, largely in rural and small public libraries. Uh, use services, 
director, you name it, I did everything. I ultimately left public libraries because I kept looking for evidence for some of the things I was trying to do and finding nothing. If you've ever read the public library research, you know it's it's getting better, but it's been pretty terrible. And I really wanted to provide research that actually addressed real world problems that you guys identify and need answered, as opposed to some idea that an academic had without ever stepping foot in a library sometimes. So uh, I'm coming to all this advice and information I'm going to be giving you through one huge, huge study called uh, this multi-site ethno ethnographic study where I, I lived in these libraries. I made in these libraries for months at a time. Uh, three very diverse libraries. One was extremely small, a town of about 1,700 people. It had a full wood shop. Uh, one was the biggest maker space in the country, and I think still is, and has everything you can imagine. No wood shop, but an espresso book binding machine. Um, and then the third was like a mid-size, uh, about 40,000 people community. So um, urban, small, you name it, I've been in all of them. But I've also done other studies aside from this ethnographic study, uh, particularly in rural libraries, looking at their makerspace services. So, all right, we can move forward. The study itself kind of came from this idea that I was looking at makerspaces and developing my own makerspace, the first one in Wisconsin Public Library. And I kept hearing about how to develop them, how people learn, why they're awesome, you know, what library staff need, tools you need, all these sorts of things, kind of from the institutional perspective. And no one at the time that I began my study had asked the users anything, literally anything. There was one study I found that um, asked parents of children who had participated in the makerspace uh, what the parents thought. Like, that's great what the parents think, but what about the actual children? So I wanted to speak to people about what their experiences were. And I kept seeing this one word in every single one of the reports or articles I read. Go ahead and move forward. Right, here's the word, empowering, the one weird word. And you will hear this as describing what these maker spaces are intended to do for their communities, right? They empower their communities. And the thing is, is this is actually a pretty sneaky and slightly passive aggressive word. It sounds great, but when you really poke at it, like I do, poking at things with sticks, go ahead and scroll down, you'll see, well, okay, if we're empowering someone who had the power to begin with, and are they sharing all of it, some of it to everyone? Like what's happening there? Next slide. And also, what kinds of power are we talking about? Um, and is it seen as power by everyone involved in the same way? And then, next slide. Um, this is a gerund, this word, empowering. There's a process implied, an action. And no one had really asked any questions about how power was being shared what practices facilitated user power. None of these questions was really being asked when I began the study. So that's why I did the study. And I used this, this idea by Ivan Illich way back in the 70s, where he said, you know, something called a convivial tool. That tool will forward power to the user to decide how they want to use a tool, why they want to use a tool. And it should be kind of easy for everyone to use. And not only that, this tool should be used through social interdependence. It's not just an individual thing, right? So I use this framework to sort of explore what was going on in these different maker spaces. And what I'm going to share with you now is how this played out. And again, this is where I'm going to want you guys to Go ahead and chime in when you have questions or comments or ideas. So next slide, please. All right, so this is the model I came up with. We're gonna talk about all this. You don't need to recognize the model. I'm just showing it to you so you know that all of these things are really interconnected. 
So these seven capabilities people said that they needed to have to feel like they could really use these maker spaces for their own purposes, for what they thought was valuable, not what the library thought was valuable, but what they thought was valuable. They needed to have all of these things to a greater or lesser degree, depending on the person, the library, or some other circumstance. But the connections were a key point. You can imagine that thing in the center, the capability of trusting, which kind of centers everything in that study, would be very connected to the capability of coexisting with others. If you don't trust them, you're not going to coexist well, for example. So I'm going to go through each one of these capabilities with a couple of examples, but I'm hoping you guys will give me some examples that either agree or disagree with what I'm saying. Bring it on. Next slide. All right, so the first capability I want to talk about is this idea of access, right? Obviously, public libraries are all about access and not just physical access, not just I can get my hands on this 3D printer because it's here at the library. You, we all know there's more to it than that, right? There's obviously the intellectual access where do I know how to use this 3D printer? And more importantly, the socio-cultural access. What use is a 3D printer in my life, right? If you can't answer that question, you don't have access. It can be right in front of you, but it has no meaning to you. You cannot benefit from it, right? So here's some examples. Next slide. Here's an example of access and a barrier to access. You can see here, there's a lovely little maker space with all kinds of equipment. And you might be able to see that it's completely empty. If you look closer in this photo, you might see the reflections of dozens of teenagers. In this library, these teenagers would come across the street after school let out, and they would wait for a half an hour, an hour or more until their parents came to pick them up. And none of them were using the maker space. And you can wonder like, why? Why are they don't have access? What's going on? And it turned out that this branch required a parent to come in and sign a form for them to be able to use these tools. And you can kind of understand why, like if they're soldering something, soldering irons are kind of dangerous. If they're making buttons, you know, those levers can, have a lot of force, you could probably hurt your finger on that. There's some danger to the kids. But no parents could easily swing into this library. Parking situation wasn't good, right? And that's not what they were here for. They were here to just quickly pick up their kids and leave. And so no parents were signing the forms. Over and over, what I found in these maker spaces is the libraries, through the best of intention, would completely derail access to large swaths of their communities through rules like this. Um, some maker spaces would say, this is for children to learn and then require you to be 13 or older or have a parent with you the whole time. Um, has anybody here ever made anything? Anything? This is where you talk back. Lots of stuff. Jim's made some stuff. Uh, does all of it take less than an hour? Uh, well, it depends on what it is. Most of the vinyl right. does, um, dye sublimation right. generally. Yep. Uh, it really just depends on the design and whether or not the, and how prepared the customer is for the uh, design to exactly. be done. Right. So it depends on the process you're making. If you're if you're doing, yeah, Alita makes things too. So you know that sometimes you can get these things in and out and be done, but sometimes when making involves hours and hours. How many of you think your kids' parents want to sit next to their kid for hours and hours in that maker space, right? So you can imagine how, you know, requiring that parent to be there completely makes it un unaccessible for anybody. Yeah, precisely zero parents will do that. And this is unfortunately the case. I saw really two parents who were willing to in all of my study, two. All right, next slide. Not empowering, no. 
Another type of access can be shaped by the literal um, spatial considerations of your rooms and the way you think about your space. And this library did a really good job of having all of their projects and, and materials in open shelves with clear bins that were very clearly labeled. And they also encouraged a culture of people just going in and grabbing their stuff, right? Because the thing is, is our patrons are pretty clear where not to go and what not to touch. I eat 90% of the library, they won't for most of us. There's actually been studies on this. Um, people don't think that the library is their space. It's the staff space that sometimes they are allowed into. So they have a default no, don't touch kind of interaction in many of these spaces. And you have to actively tell them that it's okay to go and grab materials. You can't do that if you have them materials in locked cabinets or even in closed cabinets. Um, that just signals not for you, only for staff. So the way we organize our space can provide or limit the accessibility of the space. Anybody else have anything to say about this? How is your space arranged so people know that they have access to the materials? I'll do this a lot. I'll ask a question. I'll wait a second just to be mainly labels. All right. I'll give you a moment, but we'll come back to it if you answer later. It's fine. Labels. Oh, things are downstairs. That's a real problem. You want that, you know, people walking past your, your maker space whenever possible. And some people abandon that because for a variety of reasons, they have to sometimes, right? Closed cabinets are a real problem. One of the libraries I was in started out with these open wire bins, which were kind of visually chaotic. It was messy looking. And then they got these really beautiful sleek cabinets and suddenly no one would touch the stuff, right? Same user, same library, but the different feel to the space, right? You not only have to label, you have to ensure that they know that they're allowed to go in there because otherwise they think they can't. Yeah. All right, next slide, please. Good ideas, good. Uh, map key is a great idea. All right, then this is the socio-cultural access I was talking about, this capability of understanding your, yourself and the space in the same world, in the same life. Um, I like to give the example that once I got a grant for um, a maker space that was aimed at ensuring senior citizens were making STEM things, right? Great grant, really cool, except you know, how do you tell a bunch of senior citizen women who have not been active in STEM fields, who are in a rural library, that you want them to, like, start designing circuits, right? And some will be into it, but most people will be like, that has nothing to do with me. And then when you reframe, we're going to be making stuffed animals that have little recorders in them that you can use to record a message and give this stuffed animal to your grandkid or someone, someone else you love. Suddenly the older women totally were designing circuits. They were doing soft circuits with um, you know, conductive thread and embedding these sensors and speakers. Totally no problem, but you had to shift how you explain what the space is relative to their actual worldview. Next slide, please. So providing understanding for people can be really challenging and you might think you're doing the job. This is one of the libraries I looked at and it's two, it's two images of the same space. The first is looking down through the children's library in this long, skinny library building. Um, at the very end, there was some mysterious wheel symbol with tone on tone lettering that you couldn't read. If you didn't go all the way down there and peer through that tiny door, you wouldn't know what's in there. When you did peer through the door, that image on the right, that's what you saw. Looks like a storeroom, doesn't it? Doesn't look like a person can come in here at any point and use this stuff kind of space. It looks like staff space. So this was a dedicated space like Jim's, and it was an amazing space. Like I said, this one had a full wood shop. It had incredible tools in it, and it was open for access all of the time. 
And yet they kept the doors closed and the lights off and no staff inside. And guess how many people in one month, how many people went in there at will and used the space? Yes, you guessed correctly. All of you, Jim, Angela, Kathleen, zero people went in there. The only people who came in there when I was uh, doing my research in this library came to talk to me when I sat in that space. Otherwise, it was completely used for programs, which is, you know, not a problem necessarily, but it's not what that library wanted. All right, next slide. Next slide, please. Um, there's also some simple barriers to understanding when you put stuff out on display and you don't label it. Like this is that huge urban library has some really cool maker toys, but again, they make no sense. If you don't know that you can etch uh, a skateboard deck or create an acrylic chest set using the laser cutter, um, looking at those tools doesn't inspire you to do so necessarily. If you don't know what little bits are, those are the toys that are kind of in the middle scattered around, this has nothing to you. It's a display of nothingness. And over and over in this library, I would hear people saying like, I don't even know what this stuff is. I, who is supposed to, am I, am I allowed to use this stuff? The library had a no sign policy. So there was nothing to help them uh, understand what they could do or what these were or how they could make them. But there's also some more complicated ways to support uh, sociocultural understanding of what the space is for. And that's related to who you tell stories to. In the same library, uh, they did their first huge outreach event at a brewery in this kind of hip happening part of town that used to be African-American in a town that is 50% African-American, but gentrified and became a very um, pale and pasty part of town. Uh, young, white, uh, fairly affluent people lived there. And so they had this event at the brewery um, and it was a completely white crowd of young people who loved it, loved the stuff. Meanwhile, in another part of the same library, there was a whole room of largely unhoused, largely African-American people. And while the library had brought their maker stuff to all other places in the library, they never brought it to that area, the tech center where all these people were using computers. Never brought a 3D printer in and showed what to do with it. They never brought in their, their button machine, even though they did it for other areas. So they weren't telling the story of the space to those people. They had chosen a different audience. And you can imagine what the results are, who's using the space. Okay, next. And this kind of takes us to this capability of trust, right? Of social trust. Obviously, if you have a maker space, you are telling your patrons to some degree you trust them. You trust them not to break the stuff. You trust them to not make huge messes or, or to, to make cool stuff, right? At the same time, if your patrons are coming in and using these tools, they are telling you they trust you to allow them to do so. And I kept running into people in my study who would not use the library because they did not trust the library. They did not believe that the library would let them swear when they were recording rap songs in the soundproofed audio, uh, audio recording booth, right? Even though no one could hear them, they thought for sure they would be banned if they sweared. Um, they didn't trust that the library would not be all teachy and up in their face and let them figure it out in the way they preferred. There was a whole host of different mm, distrustful statements toward both the users and the libraries, which provided a complete barrier to using these spaces. Not empowered at all if you don't trust. All right, next slide. I'll give you a couple of examples. So here's an example of someone uh, at that outreach event I was mentioning. All the librarians, there were about eight of them, who were helping kids learn to solder, were holding the soldering irons, except for this one librarian. He was the only one who trusted the children to be safe and effective with the soldering. 
And so all these kids were walking away with these cool blinky badges that they essentially saw someone else make. It wasn't that exciting for them. This kid and all the kids who worked with this librarian, they were excited. They had made it themselves. They had done the soldering. Even the fact that it was dangerous felt powerful to them. So sometimes we have to accept a certain level of danger and risk and trust the results. And I will tell you from my own experience, I have taught hundreds and hundreds of people to solder, never had a solder accident. However, exacto knives, those are dangerous because people don't take them seriously at all. Next slide. Does anybody else have some uh, example of trust or mistrust in their library? And I'll keep talking cool. and you can fill in if you can think of something. So another thing is uh, trusting that people will clean up after themselves. Uh, when I started my makerspace, the number one question people asked was what about my carpet? You know, like they were really worried that there was going to be glue or paint or solder or whatever, completely mucking up the space. Um, they didn't trust the users to clean up. And I found in this study, everyone did. There was zero people who didn't tidy up, at least to some degree, after themselves. So that's about a cultural thing. Um, but a lot of libraries don't trust that at all. And so they have lots of little rules posted everywhere about like, you have to do this or you have to do why. And sometimes those things are required, but often not. Scheduled trust. Oh, I like this. Scheduled trust. Uh, makerspace is open on a schedule. Right. That is a limit to access um, for a lot of people. And sometimes we don't really think through who that limits access for those schedules. I know we all do our best, right? We, we only have so many resources. We only have so much staff. Um, so we do our best, but always be thinking through um, who could be left out here with this schedule. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit later, but this idea of equity and um, ensuring the least well off in your communities are supported first is a really good way to flip the switch in, in addressing, you know, who is left out. Yeah, small staff is the primary concern. I totally hear you and understand. Yeah. Next slide, please. The libraries really need to get out of the way. Angela, you are so absolutely correct. Um, not completely correct, but a lot. And that kind of goes to where I'm going here, uh, this idea of librarians getting in the way. So the capability of acting or being the agent in charge of your own um, project, rather than being acted upon by the library, was a really, really important message I got from my study. And there's three parts to this, really. First of all, you want users to have some kind of say in what occurs in these spaces, usually through some form of you know, structured, shared governance. So an advisory board um, or some other feedback loop where they, they know that not only, um, are, you know, they heard, but they have actual power to shift what occurs in the spaces. Uh, one of the people on an advisory board in my study described the power that they were actually allowed as toddler's choices. Like you can have the red chair or you could have the blue chair, but there was no discussion of a couch or a sofa, you know, a stool. Like the library had really made the decisions and we're can, then pretending to allow these decisions to the toddlers of the advisory group. So make sure that if you're gonna give people power and a say, that you do so. And that if you're worried about them not choosing the right things, maybe they haven't been trained well enough. Maybe they don't understand our access and equity mandates. They don't understand the library's mission, you know? So sometimes you have to go back to that. So ensure that people have a say in what occurs. All right. Have you had any issues with people having a say or sharing any governance? Does anybody share governance of their makerspace? Crickets. Let's move on. Next slide then. 
The next thing is this is kind of going back to the library is getting up in the way, as, as Angela had mentioned. Um, <laughs> Kurt cuts. Oh, that was clever, Robert. Um, <laughs> Kathleen's on it too. I saw this over and over where librarians would swoop in and take over projects. It was crazy. Um, so in this particular image, you can see the person in the back just kind of like holding their keys as librarians circled around their grommet setting and like took it over. And later I talked to this person and they were like, yeah, I kind of wanted to learn how to do it myself. And then I talked to the librarian and they were like, um, I just wanted to be sure they had a successful project. Well, who defines what success looks like, right? And often the library staff is defining that success. And we need to let go of that business right away because people want different things from these spaces and assuming that you know what they want is never a good policy. And we all know this, right? From our reference interview training and all this other stuff we do in libraries. Sometimes, Angela, it is about the product. Sometimes it is about the process. You need to ask the person which it is in this particular case. So some people are gonna come in and they're gonna want the banner that they just spent a lot of time printing out to have perfect grommets. And other people are just gonna to wanna to learn how to set the grommets. Um, let, yeah, yeah, let people fail. Or if you see that somebody is about to fail, Robert, um, ask them what they think about failure. Ask them, you know, is it important for this project to be successful as in some, you know, you define what that looks like? Or are you looking at uh, just learning the process and failure is okay, it's just part of the process of learning, right? Cost impact is a thing, right? So if some people just spent, you know, $20 or $30 printing out a banner, they don't want to wreck that and have to print another banner. So that's where the library needs to know to ask. Ask and let the users define their version of good or quality or whatever it is that they need, as opposed to assuming. Next slide, please. And then the other aspect of the capability of acting or being able to act is being able to enrich or bring back to the spaces and give back to the spaces of maybe your own expertise. Uh, this person in this image was a fashion and jewelry designer and really, really good and wanted to teach sewing classes and fashion design courses at this library. And they wouldn't allow it because at that library, you had to have a, a background check to volunteer, even if you were doing it, you know, just informally, like in the maker space, didn't matter. And they made the people, the volunteers pay for those background checks. So, you know, I, he couldn't pay for it. He wasn't went very well off. He's a fashion designer. He's not rolling in money. And so he was not able to structurally give back and lead classes or, or even informally engage without being shut down by the library. So be sure that you're, you're thinking of how can people be encouraged and supported in sharing their knowledge or give it back to the space. Next slide. Do you guys have anybody, uh, do any of you have uh, community members teaching workshops in your maker spaces or otherwise taking the lead on that sort of thing? Yes, great. Um, any particular success stories you want to share on or, or failures? We'll talk about either. Um, collab with the schools. That's very cool. Uh, that's excellent. Sometimes you can find people in the schools who know a lot. Um, I, in my makerspace, had an 11 year old who became our de facto 3D printing expert. And whenever I couldn't train someone on how to use our 3D printer, and this was like uh, 11 years ago, I think. Um, what would happen is this kid, I would call this kid if he were home and ask him to bike over and teach somebody how to use, you know, how to use the, the printer. And later on, after I left that library, I did a study and found that that kid in particular and several of the people he had taught thought the best part of the makerspace experience for them was learning from and with each other. It wasn't about the tools. It was about learning from a young kid or teaching a 65 year old when you're 11. 
I highly recommend makers in residence or you know artists in residence in your space if you can get them. Excellent, excellent. Oh, that sounds wonderful. Sewing class is a really good way to incorporate the the users to to be the experts, and that's really what maker spaces are about. Uh, a lot of us learn only enough to be able to teach the next group, and that helps us learn more. So yeah. Next slide, please. So we're going to be talking about the capability of choosing your means and your ends. Now, let me talk about what, the, what I'm getting at here. So we have something in public libraries called the library faith. You might have heard of this. This is a story we tell ourselves about why libraries exist and how they do what we think they should be doing, right? So these library faith that used to be like, um, we are going to enculturate um, poor and immigrant people, this is the original library faith, by the way, into American society in the 1850s and 60s by showing them how to behave around good books, right? So that was one of the original things. And now the makerspace imaginaire or library faith often ha happens around this idea like we are giving them access to these advanced technological tools and by doing giving them that access we are giving them 21st job skill century job skills or creating creative people or whatever it is that you're telling yourself right this is the story and sometimes the people don't get to choose the story for themselves right so it can be easy it can be i want to make this and then you you know follow through on what they said they wanted to make. And you have your soldering classes and your portrait studio classes and your edge making classes and whatever. You do what they ask for. That's easy. We're pretty good at it. Next slide. But sometimes it gets more complicated. In this story, this kid wanted to make a phone case out of glue, hot glue. And the first librarian's like, absolutely not. It's dangerous. You're going to burn yourself. It's a waste of our glue resources and you'll probably ruin your phone. No. And so the kid was bombed and asked the other librarian who said, yeah, let's find a way to do this safely. Let's make a template of your phone out of parchment paper. Let's, you know, and actually work with them to let them choose what they wanted to do. They didn't say this is a stupid idea and you could build a better printer, a better phone case on the 3D printer. They honored the kids' ability to choose for themselves and made it happen. Unfortunately, too many of us are doing what the first librarian did. and Not enough are helping with what the second librarian did. So we need to choose, allow, allow people to choose what they want to do and why they want to do it. I'm going to come back to that theme in a minute. Anybody have anything to share about this? The power of us asking open-ended questions, right? Like, I I Amy, if you're meaning like, um, how do you want to do this? What, you know, what, what do you think we should do to make this happen, this phone case? Those are some good questions as opposed to just saying no, right? Next slide then. All right, this capability is a little more challenging because it's very diverse. People, yeah, kids are smarter than us quite regularly. Um, people want to connect in these spaces, but it's not always as you might expect. So despite the constant rhetoric around collaboration in these spaces, I saw almost no collaboration, very, very little. Obviously in that last image, that kid collaborated with the librarian to make a product. But for example, two strangers coming in to work together does not happen. Just never or almost never. Next slide, please. And that's not always what people wanted anyway. Um, some people don't want to connect with others on any potent level, but they want to see what others are doing and they want to be inspired by others. So there's different levels of sociality that you can support and often you will need to support very deliberately and structurally. Here's another example. So this library, you can see a picture, it's vast, this maker space, it's very huge, but most of the equipment, equipment is facing the wall or the window. So when you're making, you can't see what other people are doing around you, right? 
Also, each little section is very far away from the other sections. So when you're sewing, you're not seeing what's happening on the 3D printers, right? You just can't interact with one another. Plus, this library had a culture of shush. And so this is the quietest makerspace I've ever been in. No one talked to anyone. It felt like a huge emotional labor to even go up and ask a question of someone. Yeah, could I have about, I would love a third of their space myself. Shush is, yeah, shush is sometimes patrons do it to us. Absolutely. And I've seen that. But this, you know, the library staff didn't want it to be a culture of shush. It just was because they weren't actively pounding against it. Sometimes you have to actively resist these ideas that are either in your patron's head or just the way it had been in your library. So in this library, they had some reasons that they did not want patrons to interact with one another, right? Big urban space, downtown, there's just some drug use. Sometimes people annoy each other. They want privacy issues. Good reasons, right? But they overemphasize those reasons to the point where anyone trying to ask somebody a question would get shut down by the staff or the staff would zip over to make sure no one's being you know, harassed. And so there's a balancing act here, right? There's a balancing act of like ensuring that people are, feel safe and cared for and protected in your space and allowing them to engage with one another. Next slide. Do you guys have any problems with people being able to coexist in the space? Are they sharing nicely? Not an issue for Jim. Good. I never saw any issues with sharing. Uh, actually, I should say I saw one issue with sharing where one teenager uh, was trying to print something on the 3D printer and another came in and then just took their stuff out and started printing without asking. But every other time somebody would say, hey, is anybody using this? People were really good. Every once in a while, you get people collaborating on things. This is so exciting. Now, I want to know, Tristan, do they know each other beforehand? Mm, 50 50 that's amazing to me because i saw i think maybe two instances in the months i was you know the 400 plus hours i was in these spaces where a stranger actually worked with another stranger and one of them was with me so yeah i, I wasn't seeing a lot of it unfortunately so some of the ideas i have about about this is um building in these ways and moments for people to come together. So having in your programs, for example, designing the program so they have to work together. This is a, a bouncy ball felting class where, you know, people had to work together on these balls to make them work. Um, they couldn't do it alone. So you can build in collaborative processes that way. Not everybody wants to collaborate with someone else, though. So you can think of other ways to encourage shared storytelling opportunities and moments. Um, having a book of all the projects that people would allow you to, to record that they've made in the space. That's a really good way because people can then on their own terms look at the book or not as they choose. Um, another thing is having show and tell in your programs making sure you leave a little space in those programs so people can come up and talk about what they did with their project and why. Um, just really considering a sort of enzymatic librarianship is how I call it. Like the librarian is the enzyme and the compost pile that gets things circulating, breaking down all those barriers. So having this culture of going out and welcoming people into the space very actively and then saying, oh, you're interested in this. Let me introduce you to this person who is also working on this. Um, and instead of saying that that's an invasion of privacy, you know, make, taking people's temperature around whether they're willing to do that and then really actively engaging people together. Then sometimes you'll get to that collaboration, but otherwise I was not not seeing much. All right, next slide. And then uh, the capability of adapting the environment and yourself. So uh, 
there's a, a few different areas here. First of all, can you physically adapt the space to meet your needs? And all too often, we're asking the patrons or users to adapt themselves to meet the library's needs, right? And same with their disposition, their personality or the way they approach things. Uh, we're often not taking seriously enough the amount of emotional work it is to, to raise your hand and ask a question of a staff member. So one of the libraries I looked at had almost no signs, no orientation, nothing. And the librarians just said, well, they just have to ask. We'll, we'll waive the rules. They just have to ask. Well, that implies that you're comfortable enough in asking or that you feel like you deserve um, to have the rules waived on your behalf. And most people don't feel that, um, especially women, uh, kids, and you know, racial and ethnic minorities, right? So in, a, in our culture, those people are typically trained not to ask for exceptions or bonuses or help, right? And so what we're doing is we're privileging a certain small group of people. They get the, they get the waivers, they get the help, they get the, whatever they need because they're comfortable bothering the librarians and asking questions. So next slide, please. So we can look at it as like, can they move the stuff in the space? Like clearly this library wants you to be able to use the electrical outlets wherever you want, but do they know that they can move the, um, they can move the chairs? This library had the most uncomfortable cold metal stools at the work tables, but really soft cushy stool, uh, chairs in another area of the library. And it took a long time for people to realize that no one cared if you moved the comfy chair over. Do your patrons know that? They can do that. Um, Jim is saying, can I help you with something is more effective than waiting? Yeah, absolutely. And rather than even, can I help you with something, um, you know, which implies they need help, right? You might say, hey, let me show you around. Are you new here? You know, you just, just dive in right in. Don't even ask if they want help because that, like I said, it implies a lack. And some people are really bothered by that. I had multiple people saying, I hate that feeling. So do you want the tour? There you go. Yeah, very good. Good language. All right, next slide, please. Um, another area in which we need to adapt and, and allow users to adapt is a lot more complicated. And this is related to the issue of using the Makerspaces tools to do projects that take longer than, you know, that hour I was talking about before. Just like no parent is going to be able to sit there for the eight hours it takes to, you know, 3D print something substantial. Um, also, many of the projects people are working on require you to leave parts in your project and come back to them later. Here I am working on some, uh, an Arduino project, microprocessor, and I didn't have a breadboard with me. And I didn't have those wires. I had all the other components. I had the Arduino, but I had to use the library stuff. And guess what? When I left, I had to take all those wires out, all the components out. It wasn't done. It takes a while to troubleshoot a prototype. And I had to do it all completely over again from the blurry photos I took on my phone, um, trying to, to learn it over again the next day. Um, we need to have storage. This is over and over and over. If we want to really support actual making, we need to supply storage. If you're making a skirt and you're pinning your hem and you don't get to the, the part where you sew your hem, what do you do with the pins? If they belong to the library, you have to take them all out, take your thing home. And that's just disastrous. So can people adapt the use of the space to support real making, not just pretending to make or sampling making, but actually making. And what I'm seeing over and over in our spaces is, nah, we haven't thought that through. Maybe we don't make on our own and we develop a space without realizing what is entailed is often a lot of time. Next slide, please. All right, so I'm gonna talk about these key takeaways. I want to I wanna give a moment first, though. Does anybody have any stories or questions or ideas or anything about what I've talked about so far? All right. 
then I am going to talk about these takeaways because these are the things I really want you to keep in mind as you're thinking about your space. So first of all, um, we're reproducing exit inequities. We're essentially privileging young, fairly well-educated, fairly affluent white men who already have a comfortable with STEM in a lot of our maker spaces. Not, we're just not helping the people who really need the help. Um, we're requiring certain dispositions. You have to be comfortable being a self-starter if there's no programs. You have to be comfortable asking questions if there's no signs. We can develop those dispositions, but they shouldn't be a prerequisite when you enter the door. Um, I can tell you these makerspaces are not largely convivial tools. They do not forward power to the users for the most part, um, only for some people and in some ways. And they're not always social either. All right, forward. Um, we're getting close to the end of this webinar. I just, I know this, and I want you guys to have the chance to ask questions. So please interject. If you don't, I'll keep talking until our time is up, all right? So this is Rose. She was an older African-American woman um, in her 70s who was doing an amazing project uh, that was actually featured on the news with the mayor of this urban environment, uh, library. And what happened was, you know, the library said anybody can make anything in these spaces, and then they changed the rules so that she had been using multiple tools, working, creating buttons and t-shirts and bumper stickers for this, you know, community-centered anti-litter campaign. And suddenly the rules were you can only use this tool six times in six weeks. And that was the end of her project. I saw this over and over where we would pretend, we librarians would pretend you could make anything you wanted in these spaces and then make dumb rules that prohibited that. Next slide. Oops, oops, back. All right, I just want to talk about the hidden curriculum and then um, the casual and serious leisure just for a moment. The hidden curriculum is when you say you should be learning you should be doing this, you should be doing that, um, instead of asking the users what they want to do. Sometimes making is not about learning. That African-American woman, Rose, I just showed you, she already knew how to do all that stuff. She wasn't there to learn, she was there to make. And we sometimes forget that. And then the casual leisure and serious leisure, Serious leisure are those people who independently come up with projects and level up their skills and, they're kind of who we aim makerspaces towards for the most part. Casual leisure audiences are the people who like to come and hang out and recreationally make something with friends, often in programs. Those are two different audiences. Your casual leisure users are almost never going to level up to serious leisure. Just let it go. It's just not going to happen. They want different things. Casual leisure users are almost always, first of all, women. And those women are so grateful for a chance to not have to plan or gather materials or come up with what is happening. They can just show up, have fun with their friends and family, and take home a cool thing when, when they go home. So supporting casual leisure as well as serious leisure is incredibly important to empowering your makerspace. All right, the final thing I want to mention is that I gave you guys this checklist, uh, the Convivial Capabilities Checklist. It's got a gazillion questions. You can forward a couple slides for me. That would be great. Yes, listening at first contacts tells you where that person is. Yes, just, you know, what are you trying to get out of this? Are you just trying to have fun? You're trying to mess around, play? Um, nothing wrong with that. We want you to be able to do that. So uh, meet them on their level and don't dismiss like I, I saw in one library, you know, they had lots of programs. They were providing the support for the casual leisure, but they would roll their eyes and talk about them like, oh, they're a totally different crowd, those program dependent people, right? So yeah, you have to figure out what you're right, Robert, you know, have open hours for some people, have programs for others, 
don't limit their opportunities, give them more opportunities. So this checklist comes out of all my research and it will give you um, some really hard questions, some of these, to ask of your makerspace as you're developing it and continuing to develop it, if you have one or you don't yet, uh, about how can you ensure that the people who are not the, the, you know, commonly the best well off, the most well off, like those well educated, you know, white dudes, maybe if we put them aside for a moment and say, yes, we do want men in the library. And obviously that's a, an issue, but what about those who are the least well off in our community? How can we make sure they are using the space, that they get value from this space? And so this four pages of questions is intended to provide you opportunities for your library's makerspace to really be powerful in people's lives. So here, welcoming more questions, more thoughts. The PDF folder says it's empty. Well, um, let me see here. Does this link work for you? Yes, the link works. Great, that's my website, that's where it's located. You're welcome to take it from there. Um, yeah, and we could certainly talk about some of the questions on here. Some of them are really complicated. Um, can people, you know, what, I'm talking about signage and, and what are your time limits for your makerspace? You know, do you have a, an hour long time limit for your 3D printer? Guess what? can't make anything on a printer in an hour or nothing much of value. <laughs> and think about what can go wrong and what can go right. You know, what, what ideas work for your community, not you, not your library, but asking the actual community what they need to, to, to do their making. And very few libraries do that. Someone asked me at the beginning, I think it was, um, well, I can't remember now who it was, Alita maybe, who asked, what would you do um, if you were creating a makerspace? The number thing, one thing I would do is ask. Yeah, ask the questions in this checklist, for example, of their users. Yep, 3D prints to, limited to the hours you're open. And it's totally understandable. You don't have the resources for staff to stay overnight. Uh, it might be nice if you did offer an overnight option, maybe occasionally. Right. So, OK, maybe you do have um, once a month an overnight option. And then if it works, it works. And if you come back and you find 3D printer spaghetti, then that's what happened this time. Uh, it's up to you how you figure those things out. Yeah. Changed more traffic when you um, opened your hours up to a different time. Yeah, 10 to 2 is crazy talk because who can use a makerspace from 10 till 2? Um, people are in school, people are in work. Uh, it's not going to be as useful as later in the evening is going to be much more useful for a lot more people. Um, you have overnight almost every night. Excellent, Robert. That's great. And do you find that you have a lot of errors or problems? Not much. Yeah. You know, I've print, you know, I have a few um, 3D printers of my own and I've had some errors where I come back to spaghetti, but almost always that's not what happens. Even if it, there is an error, um, it just stops and you're not wasting resources. So it's no big deal. You can always send the spaghetti to the children's department and they'll figure yes. something out to do with they'll it. They'll find something to do with it always. All right, guys. Well, we got through the whole slideshow pretty much, but I didn't hear as much of your stories as I would have liked to. So if you want to share stories with me, here's my contact information. I would love to hear about what's going well, what's not going well. And honestly, I'm starting a, a couple new makerspace research projects. One of them is I'm going to be looking at failure, make, makerspace fail, because I've had so many people come up and say, yep, no one uses it. And I want to find out what's going on there. So if you have a, what you perceive of as a fail, please reach out to me, be part of the research. Shannon's very responsive to questions and um, ongoing interactions. And so you, you take her up on this. This is- Please do, uh, use my expertise, yes. You're getting an early Christmas present, y'all. This is a good one. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have as you're as you're running into issues or as you're um, developing a space or anything else. So, oh, awesome! You're collaborating with the schools. That's wonderful, Jim. Well, Shannon, I just want to thank you for doing this for us. Thank you. And, um, I need to mention too that we want to thank IMLS just for funding yes. this so we can do this and um, have this available to um, learn from and to share with others even. So um, I don't know, check in the chat, you're getting blasted with thanks. Um, Great, so oh, thank you. Contact Shannon and if you, for some reason don't aren't able to connect with her, hit me up and I'll hook you up with her. Maybe you write right. an email down wrong or something. That's, you know. You can find me at UK. If you just look at the faculty, you'll find yep. me on the School of Information Science. So a Thank lot of appreciation, Shannon. That was amazing. Even Great. even better than I dreamed. So thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. And all right, guys. Bye-bye, all. Take care, everyone, for coming.